thank Thank you. Thanks and very you. much, Carl. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I hope everyone can can hear me. I am in a very, very rural part of Cornwall, and we uh, do have issues around uh, Wi-Fi and connectivity and so on. So if I do become unintelligible, please, please tell me in the chat. And if needs be, I can actually move location. There might be a pregnant pause of five minutes, but uh, if I have to, I, I've got another place I can try. OK, so um, yes, please do, do ask questions as we go along, because um, I think uh, as we're not particularly constrained by time tonight, it would be nice to, to uh, keep the questions kind of current with what, what we're actually looking at on the screen at the same time. Um, so thank you. Right, just uh, I'll give you a, a real quick uh, introduction to me. I'm uh, Chris Jones. I'm a farmer. I'm now actually the land, sorry, the communities and land uh, director for um, Beaver Trust, uh, and we think this is a good move because we're rapidly, I think, entering an era where it's not going to be individual landowners or NGOs who think it's a good idea to put some beavers in an enclosure somewhere. We're going to be much, much more out in the uh, a big wide world, and uh, I've already been working for nearly a year now with a couple of uh, parishes uh, in the southwest who want to have um, their streams uh, beavered up for, for a, a number of reasons, but chief among which is to try and uh, get some low cost natural flood management in, in place. Um, uh, so that's me. Uh, for my sins, I'm a, an old and worn out farmer. Uh, I'm the host of the Cornwall Beaver Project. Uh, in fact, Doris, I was the instigator of that, but it's very much a partnership with me and uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and uh, and now Beaver Trust as well um, and we've been going for about two and a half years now right so anyway here we go brilliant British beavers that's interesting my screen seems to have frozen Uh, I might need to unshare my screen and just unjam, unjam. Um, yeah, that's okay, unjam. Chris. Yeah, if you want to unshare it and um, just, you might better start the slide presentation again. Okay, now it seems to want to work. So, um, so um, there you go. It started. To... <clears throat> okay, so. Why are we even bothered with, uh, with beavers at all? Well, basically, uh, a big motivation is that we are uh, well and truly stuck in, not, not expecting, we're now stuck in the climate and extinction emergency. The cost of flooding, for example, has just grown and grown and grown. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's not just the cost of the economy when it does flood, it's also the amount of money we're spending on flooding. Uh, we're now annually uh, in the current round of, uh, of flood prevention work uh, at around about uh, a billion a year. Um, State of nature uh, was just yesterday, wasn't it? I think they decided that we were in the in the bottom uh, 10 percentile of all the countries in the world for, for loss of wildlife. Um, and. Uh, I'm not even sure we're the 29th most de de nature depleted. I think we've sunk even further than that. Food and water is, is deeply in crisis, not only 
are we losing our soil facility, uh, fertility, but also uh, we're knackering up our waterways and so on with all the crap that we're putting in, in, um, in the water as well. And the last numbers I saw is with only 14% of our rivers in good e ecological condition. And interestingly, the beaver can actually help with all of these things. And we should uh, begin to adopt it, I think. So anyway, we took a little bit out about the beaver itself. H here it is, this is a nice picture of a, a, a good Cornish beaver. I think that's mum, uh, just having a browse amongst some uh, bankside vegetation. So th this animal has uh, evolved over millions of years uh, on a very similar time frame to human beings. Um, if we go back into the, um, I guess, the, the, the period of time um, just following the last ice age, there would have been hundreds of millions of them across Northern Hemisphere. I'm only saying that because uh, although no one was writing down uh, that when, when there were Stone Age men rampaging across the land landscape, we know what the situation was in North America uh, when Columbus arrived. And we know what the situation was there was because we were busy counting the beaver skins as we exported them to Europe um, from about the 1630s onwards. And we think in North, North America, there were a minimum of 200 million beavers and possibly as many as 400 million. And we know what a profound, profound uh, um, impact they had uh, on the environment when they were there and what a profound impact it had when they were removed as well. Arguably, they showed humans how to build and how to manage water and how to farm land. Um, if you look at a beaver lodge, for example, it is not that dissimilar um, to early human dwellings made of sticks and mud. Uh, they have been renowned and revered as a managers of water in uh, uh, ancient Persian times when there were still beavers in the north of that country. They, it was it, illegal to interfere with beavers anywhere because they were so, so valued. And it's noted that they um, arguably farm land alongside rivers. You know, they cut down trees, which lets in light uh, and lets a much wider range of uh, flora to uh, flourish. And um, uh, then they're able to, to uh, exploit that as well. They've been hunted both here and uh, in North America too, for their fur and for their meat and for castorium, which is the uh, uh, exudation from their uh, castorium glands and which is famously used both in for pain relief and also for perfume. And not mentioned there actually, another one is that they were used for um, a kind of vanilla essence. So think about that when you have a sucker on ice cream that uh, if you've been doing it a couple hundred years ago, it might well have been something from a beaver's backside. They, um, in North America, they drove the expansion of the Europeans across that continent. Uh, it says the Hudson Bay Company there. There was an American fur company as well, and there were other offshoots of those, uh, including the French, all doing their thing as well. And they started wars in North America. They ended wars in North America, uh, and they literally drove the expansion. Um, Lewis and Clark didn't uh, go to the west coast of America just to see what was on the West Coast, that they went there looking for beavers. In Europe, they were very largely gone by 1600 uh, and probably completely gone in Britain uh, or very, very nearly so. Um, there are odd little records from here and there going into the uh, 18th century, but really very, very little. But we can see it in place names, Beaver, Beverly, Bybrook, et cetera, et cetera. Now, since that time, when in Europe, we were down to really, really tiny pockets 
maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred beavers across the whole of their former range, which extended from uh, the west of Wales right over to the far east of Siberia to Vladivostok uh, and down across Europe to the Mediterranean coast, down through Asia Minor and the Holy Land into Syria and Iraq, uh, down into uh, Iran, um, and then across the great arc uh, of uh, Northern Asia, north of the Himalayas, through all the stands, over into Mongolia and Northern China, uh, and right up into the Arctic Circle as well. A very, very broad range um, uh, of a species which was just about reduced to nothing. There were a little populations in Mongolia, bits of Russia and Belarus, uh, the Camargue um, in South of France, the Elbe Valley in uh, um, Germany, and uh, little bits of Norway. Since then, they've recovered from that sort of uh, number back up to about a million and a half or so. Uh, across the range. Came back here in um, uh, to Britain um, in Kent. First of all, that was Hamfen, uh, a, a project led by Kent Wildlife Trust, so well done them, um, back in 2002. They arrived back in Scotland at the same time with a small uh, a number, I think just a pair to begin with, at a place called Banff in Perthshire. 2009, Napdale, the official Scottish uh, project, by which time there were already beavers living wild uh, in Kent on the, the, um, the, uh, the Stour, um, and uh, also living wild on the Tay by then. And just a point to note, if one has enclosed beavers, uh, sooner or later you're gonna get unenclosed beavers because they are very, very good at escaping from places, and of course, anyone who knows anything about fencing knows that uh, from the day it's actually in place, it starts to deteriorate. And uh, sooner or later, little buggers will get out. So 2015 to 2020, we had the uh, historic a River Otter Trial, uh, which resulted for some escaped beavers that were uh, going to be rounded up and um, disposed of uh, by DEFRA. There was such an outcry down there uh, that uh, DEFRA backed off and said, okay, uh, it, it get a license and they can stay, uh, or rather get a license and we will re-release them after we've done some health screening on them. And, and that's what happened there. Uh, in 2019, as a result of the success of the Napdale project, um, uh, but also uh, in response to pretty serious uh, pu public outcries about culling beavers, they were given protected status in, in Scotland, although at the same time they were uh, uh, issuing licenses for lethal control in Scotland as well. And right up to date, we've got the 2021, um, the 2021 DEFRA consultation, which I hope you've all seen. If you haven't, please do look at it. It's, it's there on the web. Um, it has uh, a great deal of contradictions in it, I feel, and begs very many questions. And we can talk about those later as we go on. Okay, yeah, we talked about the current situation. Look how many there are in Sweden, for example. Look how many there are in Norway uh, and Germany and Belarus. Uh, there are only a few in Denmark, mainly because they've only just got back there. Um, Luxembourg, only a few, very small country, only just reintroduced. But bear in mind, overall, a million, million and a half across across the whole uh, the whole range. <clears throat> right, 2020, there were about 800. Uh, I should tell you, in 2021, we're now somewhere over the th thousand mark in Scotland. And if we, there was quite a big jump there, and I, I think it's because there was a um, a, a reduction in the in the survey intensity for the book, and uh, they have increased in number. There were also a further 115, I think, killed there in 2020 under license. Um, in that same period, 
2019 to 2021, we've had approximately 50 captured and brought down to um, uh, release into licensed sites in Cornwall, uh, sorry, in, uh, in England, and um, although several have come to Cornwall. Um, it, it's a really, really interesting thing in Scotland, if you capture a beaver uh, to translocate, it uh, has to be tagged and there's a whole bunch of stuff has to happen to it. But furthermore, it will not be released to England until there is an actual release license uh, number uh, to put it against. So the slow issuing of licenses is, if you like, or it could be argued is partly to blame for uh, beaver culling in Scotland, because for a, a, a Scottish farmer, it costs him time and money to go and shoot a beaver, whereas um, they can be captured and uh, translocated at English expense if we're allowed to do it. I'm just checking the chat to see if there's any questions. No questions, or not. Well, a little bit about the biology of the animal. It's, it's a biggish rodent. Um, second biggest in the world. 20 kilos is a really average weight. They can be uh, over 30. That's really unusual, but they can be uh, uh, much, much bigger than, than the average. Very strongly webbed hind feet, which give it most of the motive power for swimming. They do use their tails for swimming too, but uh, that's only in very uh, special circumstances when they really, really want to motor in the water. Uh, the fur is pretty much waterproof, two layers. The top layer of guard hair and then the, the under fur is really interesting. It's very, very dense for a start, but also the strands, the individual strands are all uh, hooked so that it becomes um, a very... Um, <laughs> Uh, once it's under the pressure of water, it becomes very, very tightly matted um, and, and remains waterproof. The tail is multi-purpose. They use it for uh, a store of fat. They use it for signaling other beavers in times of trouble. And I think also they used it a bit socially as well. I have noticed two beavers swimming coming down, slapping their tails together as if to say, I'm a beaver and I'm a beaver too, uh, and so on. Um, but they will certainly uh, uh, slap their tails if they perceive danger or if they're annoyed about something. Um, they also use it as an organ of balance when they're moving around. They spend quite a lot of time walking on their hind legs. So they use the, the tail as, a, a, as a, a, a thing of balance at that point. But also they will sit on their tails as well. They have transparent uh, eyelids. Uh, which helps them to see a little bit underwater, although their, uh, their sight isn't particularly good. They're, they're, the the um, hearing and especially smell are much, much sharper. Um, I think they have one of the best senses of smells of any mammal. They have a, a special set of lips behind their front teeth, so they can actually close their mouth and still be using their incisors to uh, uh, chew through bits of wood and so on underwater. The incisor teeth are impregnated with iron. Uh, they have uh, kits, usually in the spring, usually around about April time in, in our climate, uh, which will move out in their uh, sometime during their third year in, in uh, a normal, normal year. They are very, very highly territorial and they will kill each other uh, over, over territory quite readily. They have very few predators in this country. Uh, in um, the rest of Europe, they could be uh, taken out by that. The biggest threat here is only to kits, and that would be from an otter, or maybe, just maybe a fox. Um, and indeed, otters are not tolerated uh, by beavers uh, during, the, during the, uh, the actual kit dependency period, if you like. And I've just seen a photograph of an otter with the top of its head stoved in by a beaver, um, literally uh, a skull broken through and the brain exposed. And 
the uh, the otter did not survive, uh, and, and we're imagining that um, it probably uh, was caught red-handed inside the lodge. They are strictly herbivorous. Uh, they eat an awful lot of soft vegetation, and then uh, quite a lot of bark as well. Um, the bark tends to be from uh, willow, maples, aspens, that kind of thing. Quite keen on oak, not very keen on alder. But the, you know, it, I, I say when people say what do they eat uh, down at our enclosure, I say just about anything you can see here. Um, I've even seen them eating gorse. Brambles are a very special favourite, and uh, they, they've eaten vast amounts of bram bramble on our site. Um, but also grass, ferns, sedges, you name it. Uh, and, and slowly the vegetation is changing. Um, so we're getting the creation of what uh, are sometimes called beaver lawns next to the stream. Right, now, one thing that uh, beavers do, and um, it's, it's one of their most useful attributes, I think, as far as we're concerned, is they build dams. But they don't build dams everywhere. Uh, and the reason they want to uh, have a or build a dam is to raise the water level. They want to have, or they need to have, as a minimum, uh, a, a enough depth to cover the entrance to their lodge, which is always situated underwater. But also, they want water which is swimmable uh, so they can get to their sources of food. And, you know, they're very vulnerable uh, to predators because they're quite slow lumbering beasts. And if they don't have water to swim through, they don't really feel very comfortable. And by and large, they, stand, they spend um, nearly all their time within 20 meters of the water. And they're constantly um, in a place where the river is quite shallow. They're constantly looking to uh, increase the, the spread of water, which they achieve through damming. Uh, they will also build canals and so on, so that they can, they can swim out to sources of food well beyond the actual stream or, or their dams as well. So depending on the topography, um, they can have a very, very profound effect on, on the surrounding land. The dams are made of mud and sticks and stones. Typically, and I'll show you some pictures in a while, typically they, they uh, start with a few sticks and a few stones, and then uh, as it progresses, they begin to add mud as well. And I, I, would, I would say that probably somewhere around 50% of the whole construction is made of mud. And something that we know to our place, you see the, the left-hand picture of the dam um, over here, that is uh, starting to green up. And in fact, today, if we were down there now, uh, as this dam is uh, over four years old, uh, you can hardly see the dam for the amount of greenery growing out of it. And what that means is that the whole thing is a living structure with living roots going down with it, which helps to make it really, really strong. They tend to continue maintaining and building and adding, adding to the structures they make um, with, with time. Um, in my, my sort of best guess is really that uh, uh, everything they start doing remains work in progress. Hey, lodges, they, they live within lodges. Now, um, this isn't always the case. If they've got a great tall bank, they may well just have a burrow that goes into the bank and they could live in there like rabbits do. There wouldn't necessarily have to be a, a great big lodge, but uh, where there's not so much bank height, they will uh, burrow in underwater and then come up into a fresh air and then begin to build a lodge on top of that. Um, the lodge is in a way is very, very similar to uh, the dam construction. Um, and they slowly build up uh, more and more sticks and more and more mud and more and more sticks and more and more mud. And it, um, it becomes a, 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 really, um, a really solid, strong structure. And, uh, you know, I, I, I weigh quite a lot. Um, uh, and I can walk on top of um, the lodges that we have here. 
or indeed the dams too, and they're just utterly sorry. They don't feel remotely flimsy. I would say about both the dams and the lodges, beavers are very, very much like us. They don't do things um, that they don't need to do. You know, we don't do much stuff we don't need to do, we? Uh, we don't go to work necessarily because we actually love it. We, we do it because some of these guys, if they had a deep river, let's say over um, a couple of feet deep uh, and then a high bank so they didn't need to build a lodge, they wouldn't do any of the things that we see here. But it's all innate in them that they can do this should they need to. Um, lots of animals are keystone species, are, aren't they? But uh, I, I tend to think it's a, a word that's overused. There is no doubt at all in my mind that beavers truly are. Uh, and I say that because of the explosion in biodiversity we've seen since uh, they've arrived in our place. Um, I often ponder on the reason for this great explosion in uh, life. And I think a, a lot of it is to do uh, with the action of building dams, because once they do that and the water slows down, it slows down to the point where algae can begin to uh, multiply. And algae, of course, is the bottom of all our aquatic, aquatic uh, food chains, but also dropping trees and so on lets in more light and, and more stuff can happen. And indeed, the clearing of brambles uh, um, lets more light in and lets more plants grow. They tend to create a mosaic of habitat with uh, patches of thick, scrubby material, um, uh, quite short grass here and there, um, uh, long grass, trees, tree stumps, coppice, uh, and so on growing. And it's a very, very variable kind of a, a habitat in, um, in a, a, a mosaic across the area. Um, People often worry about fish passage with beavers. If we look at the left-hand picture, uh, you can very clearly see water is just coming everywhere uh, uh, around the dam. And uh, what we see here is that every dam has a, uh, a free fish pass thrown in. Right, we, we're... Um, um, Getting to the point where we need to consider beaver management. There are beavers out on, I think, six English rivers now, uh, as well as several in Scotland. And where we have them living freely, there is impact. Now, in some places that impact is really minimal and really easy to fix. In other places, it's not so easy. And I think this is something which is missing from the consultation uh, from DEFRA, um, that our government is at this point offering no clear spatial strategy for the uh, restoration of this species. And I think that is a gross dereliction because it probably makes everyone think, ah, we can have beavers, let's go for it. And in fact, there are probably some catchments learning what we learn from Tayside in Scotland there are probably some places where actually to reintroduce beavers to those catchments would be um, a disaster. Uh, and I would offer that uh, the person who tried to get beavers back into catchments that go into, let's say, the uh, Cambridgeshire and Lincolnshire fens would be a very, very, very bold uh, wildlife person. So anyway, we've got the graduated hierarchy response. This is uh, um, based very much on what happens in, in Germany and then honed and uh, um, improved upon in, or not improved upon, that would, wouldn't be right. Uh, uh, let's say localized in Devon. Um, and it goes basically through a hierarchy of education and information through to local management for things. And there you see uh, a bold farmer Jones uh, protecting a tree by pa uh, painting it with glue and then throwing sand on it. Um, through to trapping and translocation if, if all else fails. Uh, 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 or, and finally, even lethal control. Now, and in Scotland, 
this is happening quite a lot. I think um, we're well over the 200 now for the uh, for the first two years of, of, of uh, their official protection abuse. So there we go. So we can manage be uh, we can manage uh, impacts on trees either by, by wrapping in wire or by painting. Um, that particular sort of brown stuff that's a, a, an official game paint. Um, but you can do ex exactly the same thing with PVA glue and sand, um, and, and that will protect uh, trees quite adequately. Uh, where there's uh, too much depth in a dam, we can reduce that by having what they call a flow device. Um, where we don't need them to block up culverts, we can protect them. Um, and these sorts of things will prevent damage to road and railways and that kind of thing, and give us some uh, protection from localised flooding as well. Okay, so uh, we've got this climate crisis jobby on hand. Um, five, million, five million homes at risk, according to the EA. Beaver natural flood management is much, much cheaper than doing it with people. And I would posit that uh, beaver dams are better than ones built by people. Um, they just do the most extraordinary job. When you look at a, a proper beaver dam, I mean, our, our oldest ones are now about uh, 1.7 meters tall. Um, uh, and that's quite impressive in itself. But also, they're about six meters thick at the base because they're constantly pushing up mud behind them. And uh, uh, this helps to make them extremely strong and very long lived. They're good for drought. In 2018, at, uh, on my farm, we had a reserve of water we could use to pump out. Uh, when we haven't seen it here in this country yet. We don't have enough beavers and we don't currently have that much wildfire in Britain. It's coming. Um, and I'm sure you can all think of areas within your own county where perhaps there has been a, a wildfire. Uh, and this is only going to increase. Water quality. And this is something we, we I think, don't talk about quite enough. We see, uh, just on my site alone, um, uh, up to about 60 centimetres of silt behind all the dams. They're extremely effective uh, at uh, um, catching runoff. And it's not just silt, it's also nitrates and phosphates. And also a whole bunch of uh, pathogens too. So we can see that all this crap we're collecting, in our case, just on 200 meters length of stream, is all crap which is not going into the oyster beds in Falmouth Bay, for example. Now, uh, if this isn't what the EA and our local water company sh uh, uh, should be doing, I don't know what else is. It, it's, it's a disgrace that uh, they're not taking a, a lot more interest in this. Um, and then, of course, carbon too. We're waiting for uh, students from Penryn uh, to come and start uh, measuring the carbon in the um, mud that's been caught up. But we know from study in North America that, uh, that the old abandoned beaver meadows have much more carbon in the soils associated with them. And I think we also know that as we waterlog soils and anaerobic uh, conditions prevail, then the decomposition of uh, uh, organic matter is slowed right down. And the surest way to pick up um, uh, uh, <clears throat> carbon is to waterlog the soil. So these animals are very important to that. Now, I'm just wondering if I can make this film work a minute. Uh, can I? No, I can't. Or can I? Let's try it. This is probably going to be very annoying. Do, do scream if it's... Uh, Right, so we're going to have to put up with a. Chelsea, if you can hear me, can you nod if you can see this? And can you hear it as well? No, okay. We don't need the we don't need the music. Yeah, I don't think um, I'm I'm getting it either, Chris. I don't think it uh, 
it, it's working but um we can we can always share the link um afterwards if need be okay you, you can't see the pictures no I, I can just see the presentation with the two pictures at the bottom uh, okay I, I all right well in that case i'll stop doing that okay okay and and um just about all other um uh riparian wildlife increases when we get the beavers in place i don't know of of, of many things that decrease in number when the beavers come um and my particularly wanky little expression i use sometimes when talking to the media is having a stream which is like a little bonfire of of biodiversity adding beavers is like throwing petrol on the bonfire um everything just goes nuts we've got uh this aspiration to have a nature recovery network and it just struck me when we first started st talking about uh beaver trust setting up our waterways if we can add uh buffers to them let's say for a sake of argument 20 meters on either bank they immediately begin to create uh, a nature recovery network. And certainly in many places, it would actually enable with beavers that the, the, the um, rivers could connect again with their floodplains. Arguably, uh, they are doing stage zero work for us. Um, I know in some places things have gone maybe a bit too far for beavers to very readily uh, uh, achieve a stage zero, but certainly on my farm, where the water was very much in an incised ditch, they have completely reconnected it with its uh, with its uh, floodplain. Right. So, um, our Cornwall Beaver project. Mm -hmm. We started talking about this in 2014. We had flooding in Laddock in 2012, twice in a month, which was very, and then it happened twice again in 2013, just not quite coming out into the street. It was absolutely lapping on the edge of the street, but it didn't because a tree had fallen in the river and it made me think we should hold more water on the farm. Um, and we spoke to the Environment Agency about how we might do this. And they came up with a, a, a great load of, of uh, suggestions and um, prescriptions. Um, and eventually we arrived at the point where we brought up the vulgar subject of money. What could EA uh, do to help us uh, achieve what we wanted to? And of course they had no budget at all. So we then said, all right, if we can somehow find the money to do it, what could we do about uh, maintaining it? Because if we did it, we'd have to, to keep at it, to, to keep it going. And um, they said, no, there's no, resource at all we can't do anything so we said what if we get beavers to do it for nothing and they couldn't really answer uh apart from to say uh, yes yeah, that might work and so that's what we did um we brought in two beavers uh oh sorry i should i should just go to the next point actually we we got together with Cornwall wildlife trust and the university of exeter and formed a a, a little uh, a partnership before getting beavers out there and in fact we we had um a monitoring of the river levels for two years before the beavers arrived. So we had a very, very good idea about how the, the stream behaved in times of uh, high rainfall. Uh, we brought a pair of beavers back in June 2017, um, and they've now had uh, four lots of kits. Um, yeah, four lots of kits now, and uh, that's they're, they're just doing a fabulous job. Um, We've also, because we because we couldn't just let them out, we had to have them inside an enclosure. We decided it would be uh, the engagement tool for for uh, bringing uh, beavers back into Cornwall in general. And now, although we've only got wild beavers living in the River Tamar where they've escaped from enclosures, um, we we have actually got three more uh, um, enclosed projects in Cornwall, uh, with two more coming very very soon, and. Um, uh, I think the the basis for some really good uh, community um, level 
open released as well coming in the next year or so. So what it's done, it's, it's given us some drought resilience. It's helped with stopping uh, Laddock flooding. Um, we only control, or that, that uh, beaver uh, encl enclosure only controls 5% of the catchment. So uh, we need to be careful about saying it's stopping Laddock flooding, but it's certainly helping. Um, and it, it, it indicates that if we had a few more pairs of beavers around the catchment and they were allowed out to have their normal sort of kilometer to two kilometer long um, territories, uh, we were doing a great deal to stop flooding. Um, in fact, you know, we, we, we sort of say um, if we had 10 pairs rather than uh, one pair, we'd be really, really uh, making flooding very unlikely in that village. Doesn't work everywhere, but um, it certainly seems to work here. Right, I just want to show you quickly uh, uh, how the beavers have progressed just in their first week when they were here, when they got here. So the second morning after they got here, I noticed this in the outlet from the pond that we put them in. So in the space of a week, they produced a pretty creditable dam i.e. these animals are not hanging around. Three weeks later, they started the next dam downstream. And three weeks after that, the next dam below that. And in fact, over 10 weeks, they built four dams, uh, which is, I think, pretty bloody impressive. And they reached the point where they could swim from one end of their territory to the other. The only time they'd had to walk is when they actually climbed over the dam. So, that they, they had, if you like, they'd captured the river and, and uh, um, got on with it. So three years on, this is where we're at, four years on, I should say, sorry. Um, eight dams, a bunch of ponds. Uh, and there are now four streams where there was just one. The hydrograph of water has separated uh, from the uh, uh, from the hydrograph in the site, um, lots of new species arriving. Uh, I'm not saying they're necessarily all resident and breeding there, but we have certainly observed a whole bunch of uh, of things uh, uh, um, we hadn't seen before. And also, um, we regularly uh, uh, record eleven bat species and uh, seventeen dragonflies and damselflies. So it's a fairly rich site. So this was what it looked like um, hydrograph wise before the beavers arrived. So the red line is the hydrograph of the water leaving the site. And note that it is very, very close to the blue line, uh, always exceeding it, um, but in, certainly in, in time, very, very close to it. In other words, the water just rattled through that 200 meters of, of uh, uh, channel. and uh, it, it, it came and it went. And of course, if there is really heavy rain, then uh, it just adds, adds to all the other water hitting Laddick and, and lo and behold, it can flood. So this was just 10 weeks, just 10 weeks after the beavers came. You see, you've got that same really steep, peak entering the site, but already the, um, the water leaving the site is lower in amplitude than the water entering and is much, much more uh, uh, spaced out. Now, the analogy I use here is the battery, uh, sorry, that the, the site is acting like a water battery. Before the beavers came, the battery was broken. I, as fast as you charge that battery up, it just discharged immediately. But now, just 10 weeks afterwards, the, the battery function is beginning to be changed and, and, and uh, it charges up just as fast, but discharges much more slowly. And, and I can assure you, I mean, we can go through lots of these, these, these graphs. I think there's only one in, in this thing, but that, that effect uh, is uh, very clear uh, and, and ex, uh, um, increasing as time goes by. But this is the most important one, I think. This is the peak flow before the beavers came and after the beavers came for, for every 
flood event or every high rainfall event that happened. Um, uh, this one came out, this is about a year old, this graph. So everything uh, up until now, before and after, uh, which is a period of five years uh, is recorded here. And the peak flow after the beavers is cut in half. Now, if that isn't a significant uh, outcome, I don't know what is. Um, and I can tell you that now the beavers have actually broken this experiment because they've done such a good job of damming at the top end of the site. Now, four years in, there is water actually uh, leaving the site and completely going around the whole enclosure where it comes nowhere near the, the uh, um, recording instruments. It's not, not an awful lot of it, may, maybe, maybe 10 or 15% of it, but nevertheless, they have broken the experiment. So, so there we go. And in terms of spatial uh, water um, extent, here we go. This is 20, 2016. You can see the pond here where the beavers were released in 2017. There's a stream running down through the middle, uh, and that's about it. Spring 2020, there's the original pond. It's actually a lot bigger than it was. Uh, it's it doubled in doubled in extent and also quadrupled in depth since they started. And we can see a large wet area to the west. And then, in fact, if we look further west again, almost down to the end, there are large expanses of water. And we can just see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we can just see uh, other streams running down through, through the site. And not so easy to see, but just, just here to the northwest of the, the, the original pond, there's actually another large pond there. Currently, or sorry, when, when this photograph was taken, covered up by, excuse me, covered up by the uh, canopy, but now they've felled just about every tree there. So the next, pro, uh, the next uh, series of photographs we have out, we will see uh, another uh, a large dam there. There are a couple more smaller dams in this area too as well, which we which you can't see through the trees. So it's a it's a pretty uh, uh, impressive change they've made to the uh, the place. And this was Storm Dennis, which was uh, early 2019, just giving you some idea of how mad the place is when it rains really hard. And um, you can see that the, the the dam structure there holding up well, a bit of a, a, a waterfall going over it and also lots of water around the sides where fish can move uh, should they want to. And um, yeah, there's a, 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 lot of, a lot of water there um, being held back. And if we, if we did a, a, a sort of a walkthrough with a video camera, you'd see expanses of water like this at the side, which if you went downstream, you wouldn't see at all. You'd just see a frothing torrent. So barriers. Right, um, there are obstacles to beavers coming back, partly because um, modern um, rural life and management is not leaving much space for nature. This is the uh, picture of the place in Herefordshire, um, uh, not the river Arrow, um, can't remember, it's quite, quite, a, quite a famous place a, a few years back, um, which uh, I went and took a picture of because it was, it was so. Uh, uh, shit. <laughs> um, we've got outdated um, political policies still in place, you know, and uh, uh, we've got not only a lack of regulation, we've also got regulation which is not uh, up to date. Um, society has forgotten how to live with, be uh, with beavers, and people, even in the countryside, are very, very disconnected from nature. And also, there's a financial um, uh, obstacle, and that is who's going to pay for uh, nature and its management? Who's going to pay to bring um, beavers back? I would say, I would suggest that the actual cost of bringing beavers back would be less than half of 1% of the flood budget spent for 10 years, and then rather less than that every year after that in, in management. But um, that's arguable, and uh, quite happy to argue with people about it, but it, it is not a big cost 
And if it's in that region, let's say of half a percent, um, I would say that most businesses would be really pleased to get uh, their final year figures uh, a half a percent uh, uh, plus or minus what they're budgeted for. A bit about Beaver Trust. So we started up uh, about uh, 16, 17 months ago. Uh, and the idea was that we should use beavers uh, 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 to help us restore Britain's rivers and their wildlife. Really, really driven by the climate and ecological emergency. And our, our approach is to encourage community led uh, systemic and uh, collaborative work to get these uh, animals back. Uh, and indeed, we are um, observing where animals have escaped uh, whole catchments being um, not infested with beavers yet, because there aren't that many of them, but uh, but being available for, for, for beaver colonization. If you like. um, and I don't think there are any in Warwickshire at the moment, but uh, we, may, we might not be all that far away from, from in time from when they can be. Um, and we have been funded by foundations and individuals and uh, organizations and indeed groups of people like you sitting watching this program. Um, so we've got three main things at the moment, policy, communications and restoration, but we're just coming into this thing about um, communities and land. And if you like, that is um, a, an adaptation of the restoration thing because now we're getting towards uh, um, legal licensing of whole catchments, then we need to be very, very, very much um, uh, engaged with communities. And we believe, I think, that, um, that the communities themselves are the ones who should be leading the restoration, um, and we should just be here to uh, facilitate uh, and help with that. Um, Policy, we, we, we hosted a, a national beaver summit last year uh, with the CLA and the NFU and uh, a whole range of angling organizations and conservation groups and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, Tony Juniper was there and a guy called Edward Barker, who's one of the top um, uh, civil servants in DEFRA uh, and who is responsible for uh, wildlife. And then in, in um, 2021, we're now busy supporting the, the beaver consultation. And in fact, uh, tomorrow we have the first of the English beaver strategy working group meetings on the, um, um, on the consultation. And we'll be looking to produce a, a joint response from everyone who wants to be in on that. And that includes all sorts of organizations like the RSPB and the NFU and the CLA. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to get a, 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 a really broad consensus if we can. Mm -hmm. And if we can't achieve consensus, at least a very broad number of people have been consulted and can't say they haven't. So that's where we're up to. Um, and we are also helping develop um, uh, national programs. We were, we were very much to the fore in the development of the uh, Woodlands for Water uh, initiative. and this is extending now into um, a river skates partnership, which is Beaver Trust, National Trust, Woodlands Trust, uh, and Rivers Trust. And um, we are uh, working jointly with them to not just have tree planting um, uh, buffers, but also uh, buffers where there's a, a, a range of a, a range of pos possibilities. From, for example. Um, just setting aside land and, and leaving it and letting it uh, uh, renature uh, to potential for just allowing natural processes to work. So potentially, you know, grazing might still happen next to rivers, but no uh, cultivation or chemistry uh, uh, through to uh, full on uh, 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 replanting with trees and so on. Um, and the idea being, uh, as far as beaver is concerned, is if we have good buffers, then it removes the potential for um, conflict between agricultural use and the beavers. And if we look at Scotland, although quite a lot is said about fishing, 
uh, no lethal license, lethal control license have been issued for fishing because it is basically, I don't know if any fishermen listen to this, basically the, um, uh, the evidence for beavers in interfering with migratory fish is just about nil. Uh, and in fact, what we're discovering more and more is that uh, the uh, presence of beavers actually increases the potential for, for um, uh, migratory fish. Uh, um, whereas the actual potential for a conflict with farming is really great, although that is driven by the context of topography. I, uh, if we're in uh, the fens, where there are lots of rivers perched up behind uh, uh, flood banks and, and, and uh, are higher up than the surrounding fields, if beavers get into that, uh, there is uh, room for disaster. Um, but in most situations where the river is actually lower than the surrounding agricultural land, the chances of, of there being any uh, serious contact, uh, co uh, conflict are very, very low. And especially if we just pull back a few meters away from the stream, then it gives, gives chance for the beavers to do their thing without having any, any direct conflict. And it seems to me wholly right uh, that with all the environmental benefits of, of pulling back from rivers, um, it would seem to me to be a, a completely natural uh, thing for us to want to do um, in terms of elms. I, I haven't looked at the chat for, for a while. Is anyone, is anyone asking me questions? Can anyone say? Um, no, there, are, there aren't any questions in the chat, Chris, but um, it's all fascinating stuff, okay. so if you could continue cool. right outside right. at the end. <laughs> all right, um, and then just, just look, there's a picture here of a ditch, and then a very similar ditch, one without buffers, and then one with, and you can see the, uh, uh, the tremendous potential, I think, uh, of, how, uh, of creating buffers in terms of um, uh, protecting the watercourse, uh, uh, potentially helping reduce flood risk anyway, and uh, really, really helping to catch uh, silt and stuff before it gets into the river too. So um, I just think that, that, uh, that the, the buffer thing is an absolute no brainer. Uh, and I mean, for me personally, as a farmer, um, I, I don't expect to get paid money just for being lucky enough to own land, um, but I'd very much like to be paid to protect my river and to save carbon. Um, Okay, we're involved in comms a great deal, um, one way or another. We were really lucky to host uh, a spring watch here. In fact, we did autumn watch in 2017, spring watch in 2020, then in 21 we had, 2021 we had uh, winter watch. So that, that's been a real uh, marvelous um, experience for us. And uh, I hope it's a marvelous experience for all the watchers as well. Um, we've also uh, uh, got a, a good education portal on our, um, our website. Uh, we're doing podcasts. We've released a film called Beavers Without Borders, which if you haven't seen, I recommend it. Um, uh, we did a thing with um, Simon Reeve last year, uh, which um, actually has given, given birth to a couple of uh, community projects in the Southwest, um, which we hope we'll bring to license next year when government decides what a license is going to look like. So busy bees on that. Um, I don't, I'm not going to try and play this because it's just all too difficult. Right, there we go. Uh, thank you so much for um, listening. I've probably talked quite enough now for nearly an hour. So please, please do come forward with any questions you might have. We're really happy to try and answer them. Chris, we've got a, uh, a question in the um, uh, in the chat. I think, or was it a comment? I uh, know oh, it was just a it was just a pat on the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I could do the, lots of those. Thank you. I'm just trying to find the ch uh, trying to find the chat to open it here. Uh, just be at the bottom um, with oh, the sort of the, the speech bubble. So, oh, there we go. 
Um, so someone asked, where could we find the Beavers Without Borders um, film? Would, yeah. would like to watch. Okay, uh, uh, Ch Chelsea, um, um, who, who do you work for, Chelsea? Okay, um, thanks. You can you can catch it on uh, YouTube, and um, if you look up Cornwall Beaver Project on YouTube as well, you'll probably find two or three videos in there. Uh, um, all magnificent and mostly charging a very very slightly younger but just as fat uh, Farmer Jones. And um, just if, in case there are any other questions coming through, I've got a, a, a couple, Chris. Um, the first one is um, yeah, go ahead. When, when you were talking about the um, the uh, protecting the trees with the PVA and the and the sand, assumingly that's just a, a deterrent. They don't they don't particularly like that um, for their teeth. But what I, the question I had was, what uh, diameter of tree would a beaver tackle? Um, is there a maximum or would they go for whatever's in their way? I um, uh, have observed trees a metre plus thick being um, uh, attacked, if that's the right word, by beavers. Um, I, I don't think there is a, a practical a practical limit. Uh, they won't necessarily fell the tree, but they they will damage it uh, and, and potentially potentially kill it. They, they may they may not fell it immediately, but by potentially you know damaging the tree or shorten yeah. its life, and it may fall over yeah, at some yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess exactly could could uh, yeah. yeah. And I and I guess it's like lots of wildlife, you know. Um, that they don't they don't do things that they don't need to do so they don't they don't fell them for fun it's uh it, you know there's a real uh you know there's an engineering yeah. aspect to this so fantastic yeah um uh, it, it, i have to say actually it, it often appears really really random uh um i i, I cannot get over how, how you, you know, they'll do things and you somebody just left shaking your head and thinking why have they done that um uh so yeah uh, um but the, the, they they will go for, for for big trees right i've got a, another question here from eleanor hackett right eleanor um uh, okay. normally if if they if they're in uh shallow water they'll build a dam first because they need that before they can do a lodge they need a depth of water before they can dig into the bank and, and dig a lodge uh, I would add to that though, they never really stop dam building. They're always working at them, maintaining them. So, uh, so uh, in our case, for example, they started building in June and then we saw them beginning to build a lodge in September. But then they never stopped building the dam there. And in fact, they never stopped building the lodge either. They're always adding stuff to it. And in fact, ours have built two lodges and then, then dug a bunch of tunnels as well here and there. Right now, the next one from Lunar Mountain Sea: Is there are there any hydrographs relation to the difference in greatest flood water height of a stream with and without a established beaver dam? Okay, well, uh, um, uh, only in our case we had um, the very first uh, hydrograph I showed you was before the beavers arrived, so we could see. Um, there, the the, um, the water leaving the site was always greater than the water entering it um, by a little bit. Um, uh, and then after uh, the, the dams were uh, constructed mm -hmm. really quickly afterwards, they began to um, uh, they began to knock that that hydrograph down almost straight away. Uh, did, does that make sense? That, that makes perfect sense, Chris. Excellent. Okay. Great. 
think there's another question from uh, Chelsea there. Yeah, okay, Chelsea, right. Um, other than conveniently getting a glimpse of their genitals, is there any way of telling beaver, beaver males and fields apart? No, um, and actually you can't see their genitals. Uh, everything is tucked up well, well inside them. What you have to do is to um, uh, get the, if you're doing a visual inspection, you have to get them um, uh, in such a way, someone holding the tail up, and, and then you need to get at the um, uh, the cloaca, and you kind of turn the cloaca inside out uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to, as much as you can, and you get these two little glands um, exposed, and you need to squeeze on those glands very gently, and you see what sort of exudate you get from the gland, and that is what can tell you if it's a male or a female. Don't ask me which colors which, because I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, or the other nice way, which doesn't involve any uh, such a personal um, inspection is uh, by uh, cutting a piece of hair and sending it off to a, to a genetics lab somewhere and getting them to, um, uh, to sort it out. Uh, and it, it usually takes about two weeks and costs around 25 quid and they'll tell you if it's a male or a female. Some good genetic uh, information too, uh, which I think could be very, very useful if you're uh, into uh, genetics. Uh, and I, I sus my suspicion is that some of the populations in this country are fairly genetically narrow. I think the otter beavers, for example, are fairly genetically narrow. Although there's something like 10 or 15 families looking in at. Okay. Any more questions? Are they always a monogamous pest? Do you know that um, um, they are definitely a, a very, very stable breeding pairs. Um, as so far as I know, they will remain like that until death. So yes, uh, I think we can say that. They absolutely won't tolerate unrelated beavers um, in their uh, territory, and they will absolutely not tolerate any breeding within their ter uh, within their territory, even by their own offspring. That that would not happen. So they're not just monogamous; they're very, very keen to make sure that they're the only ones breeding there at all. There's a, uh, uh, that's a really good question. How much territory does a does a beaver of, uh, 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 require? Uh, a beaver family um, would typically have a territory of, say, uh, a kilometer to a mile or even a couple of kilometers, but that very much varies with how much uh, resources available. You know, it, it, our our little um, enclosure. It is below the size um, uh, beavers would normally want, but it is very, very rich. There's an awful lot of, uh, of foodstuffs in it. So it's not like it's in the middle of a, a blasted plain with no trees and, and, and uh, you know, not much vegetation. Um, so uh, it, it, it's yeah, they can make do with less. And if you like having them in an enclosure like that, mimics what it might be like if there's a very, very dense population of these animals where uh, um, the... Uh, size of territories is constrained by uh, other beavers very close by. Where that happens, of course, you do get increasing mortality of beavers caused by each other. Um, I'm noting my, my phone is about to die. So uh, when it does, if there's more questions, I'll just um, come up on the um, on my main thing, but I won't have a camera to it, but to see my very, very... Uh, Anymore, which I'm sure will be a disaster for you all, but there you go. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thanks for letting us know that. Um, I, I've got a quick question. Um, uh, how do beavers take to invasive species like um, Himalayan balsam? Do they, I, I assume they probably eat it. Um, do they have an impact on it? Um, yes, uh, they do eat it. Um, I think it's um, a mixed kind of uh, uh, picture here 
in that, yes, they do eat it, but um, there's definitely potential for them to be spreading it as well. So um, uh, they eat um, Japanese knotweed too. In fact, lots of things I could eat Japanese knotweed. It's very nutritious. But uh, w whether or not um, that that's overall a good thing, um, I think we can all argue about. My, my own personal view is that uh, we've got Himalayan balsam now, and we've got Japanese knotweed and probably other things too. We just need to get used to it, really. Um, it's not it's not great, but um, they're there now, and I think uh, uh, getting rid of them is going to be really, really, really hard. Well, a last call for, for any questions, um, if there are any more out there. But, um, Chris... What, what a fascinating talk that was yeah yeah excellent and um learned so much more about beavers and uh yeah up here in warwickshire i know a few people on the call are uh, uh, around different parts of the uh the country but um it would be fantastic one day to be able to have beavers in in this part of the world and um you know um, the work that the beaver trust do is is really really fantastic and i and i like your community engagement approach of where that's uh, community led you know, um, it's very much uh, in line in line with how we we like to uh, develop things. Um, so, yeah, brilliant, brilliant stuff. And um, thank thank you for your time. Well, you're really really welcome. I I, I would I would absolutely um, uh, encourage people to get in in touch with us. Our emails are really easy. I'm just Chris at beavertrust.org. I'd be really pleased to um, if you've got any places which flood often, um, uh, especially sort of headwater type flooding, um, they are definitely the sort of place that beavers might be able to help. Um, I would urge you, if you've got any rivers in Warwickshire that lead into uh, uh, Cambridgeshire, from my uh, my advice would be to leave well alone. Uh, and uh, rivers going west or south, great. Anything going east, look out. <laughs> no, no one's gonna thank you. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, um, our, yeah, yeah. Our, our rivers generally go southwest or, or to the north so um yeah there's none <laughs> yeah either. okay good good stuff uh thanks very so much for listening and um like I, if i can help just do, do be in touch thank you so much well thank you chris and thank you everybody for attending i hope you hope you enjoyed that and um, Again, this was um, supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, and our project, Wilder Future Warwickshire. Um, it will be Joanna back next time. Um, we've got another uh, webinar, which is on the 19th, um, and that's with um, Bex Broad, who is uh, a young trustee at another trust, uh, talking about how to get involved in the, or in, in what the Wildlife Trust from that perspective. So um, I'll hand you all back to the capable hands of Joanna and um, thank you for your time and I uh, hope you all have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. See you later. Thank you. Bye.